I hope it will turn out to be the film I think it is, which is a very, very powerful political statement, but uh, as ominous as, and as unentertaining as that may sound, it is uh, couched in very powerful melodramatic terms, which doesn't in any way detract from what it really has to say. Uh, what the result is, I think, is going to be a superb entertainment, something that's really going to make people sit up and take notice. The tendency on the part of people, for the most, for the most part, is to sort of uh, vie away from uh, those areas of life which are painfully true and seek their entertainment in, in levels that are a little more, shall we say, a little more seductive and, uh, if, if unreal, we have, we have a thing in our business, one of the reasons that we say that the business is doing so well nowadays is the fact that uh, things are so bad. I mean, people have nothing much to do, they go to the movies, it's, be it a war, or be it a, be a polit political situation, or the world situation in general, which as we all know is horrifying. Uh, so we tend, and the industry tends to take a dim view of pictures that have political overtones. But perhaps the time has come when this is highly acceptable because people are more and more faced with the problem of really taking a good hard look at life and recognizing it for what it is. There was a man who <clears throat> feels that this kind of thing should be brought forward and laid on the table in front of the people. And uh, he feels that there's no other way to get anybody to do it unless you do something drastic. And uh, whether you agree with his methods or not, I think it's going to be very hard to disagree with his, his intention. And that's what we deal with in this picture. So I, I think it will be, uh, that's what I mean, I want to say, is a very powerful political and social statement, if I may say so. It has to do with people, never mind the politics of it. All directors have certain things they like to do. Bob happens to be, personally, a man of enormous liberal conviction. And, uh, coming from a family, the Aldrich family, the famous banking family, uh, he's a very strict disciplinarian in his work, in a very quiet way, never raises his voice, never hollers at anybody, but you know and sense that he is the boss. He's tremendously uh, well equipped in all aspects of the business, uh, where the technical thing is concerned. His first so-called major film was, happened to be with me, a film called Apache. And he followed, we followed immediately on the heels of that with another film which starred Gary Cooper and myself called Vera Cruz. And Bob was both very successful films. And then he immediately followed it with a totally different kind of subject matter called The Big Knife, Stefano Dessler. And so Bob has run the gamut of all kinds of films. And he's, he's a real solid professional. He, as we call it, when he starts a film, he does uh, what a lot of us do. He goes into training. I mean, he really goes into training. I mean, he doesn't drink, he doesn't go to bed early, he does his homework, he prepares everything in detail. He might come out on an occasional Saturday night and have a little party with a few friends quietly. But other than that, I mean, his whole orientation and his whole direction is taught his work. You have to be given enough in the script itself to, uh, to see the possibility of it. Then you have to, assuming you accept what is said in the script, and very often you'll go through the problem of rewriting to make it sound absolutely right. <clears throat> you then have to, the, your job as an actor comes to give it that, uh, that extra quality that makes you that particular believable person. Because if you don't, an audience will say, well, I don't believe him. He sounds like a nut to me. And if you are of the opinion that the subject matter and the writing is of such a nature that uh, he shouldn't come off that way, then you have to supply that. that. That's what separates one actor from another, his ability to invest what he's doing with a special quality, with a kind of life force that's different, let's say, than someone else could do. Well, I don't really know, but uh, I, I, I deliberately didn't go uh, to films, I'll say, because I knew, looking the way I do, I look like uh, the average truck driver or taxi driver, which is good for me. I like it. I knew that if I went out there to Hollywood that I would be stuck in those kinds of roles. I mean, I would never have gotten a role like the president in this movie uh, that Robert Aldridge is doing, you know, but, uh, or Captain Proust in the Hindenburg. Uh, I just never would have gotten it. I would have been playing those cops and those hoods uh, for the rest of my career.
It's the biggest role I've had, and it's a fantastic role. And it's the president, as you know, of the United States in 1981. But to be in 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 those uh, in the chocks with those uh, uh, top guns like Lancaster and Widmark and Paul Winfield, and you know, you just go down the line, and it's like all all your legends are standing there with you, Joseph Cotton and Melvin Douglas, you know. <coughs> And uh, it was kind of scary at first to get up there and call them all kinds of idiots, and uh, which the president has to do, and, uh, because there there are your legends sitting there looking at you, and you don't know what they're thinking, <laughs> but I know what I was thinking. No question about that. They make you good. They make you good. They make even if you're in trouble, they make you good. And um, uh, for a long time. Uh, well, for about a week, Joseph Cotton kept calling me son. He kept calling me. And one day he came in and he said, how are you, Mr. President? And I knew I was in good shape, you know? So, uh, you know, they really make you feel good. He's a guy that came up out of the boondocks. He's a self-made guy. He put himself through college. He's a guy who worked in the ditches. He worked as a, a car wash guy. He worked as a ditch digger. And he had to work nights to support himself uh, going through college. He was a lawyer when he went through, but self-made. So he's a street guy. So, uh, and those kind of guys, to my mind, are the best guys. And uh, I'm a street guy myself. But uh, he's, and with all that, he's very shrewd and very, very uh, honorable in his way. I mean, he has closed his eyes to a lot of things, which all of us do. But when his eyes are really opened, he realizes that, that the country is, in, is, is uh, in trouble, deep in trouble. And he tries to hedge for a while, and then he just keeps looking right in the mirror, and he has to come up against a, a basic fact that there's nobody else but him that's standing in the White House, and so he has to do the job himself. He's the best I've ever worked with, and he's got a great sense of humor, and he likes actors, and he knows how to get the most out of them, and he never loses his cool, and he's, I've never seen him lose his temper once, or even get excited. He knows what it's all about. If it rains or it snows or whatever, windy, he knows where to go and how to continue working. And if you're off on the wrong track, he, in your, in your role, he comes and tells you how to get on the right track. It's his, he has a tremendous humanity and a tremendous uh, desire to help. The role is a credible one. In some ways, I think uh, they should forgive me. In some ways, I think he's maybe the more consistent one of the lot. The role this time is the Secretary of Defense, who's, uh, in his terms, pretty straightforward in his analysis of what's wrong, or at least part of what's wrong in his department. And then as the situation develops, as the danger arises and becomes more and more critical, uh, he's the only one who's uh, straight away with the president, who looks him in the eye and gives him honest answers. Working with Bob has been one of the great pleasures of my long career. I just can't be too laudatory about him, not only as a, as a director, but as a, as a human being, as a person. Uh, during this siege of illness that I've had, he's been just a doll. It's been a very, very difficult picture to shoot mechanically with all the different levels on which it, uh, it occurs. And uh, it's been difficult for him, it's been difficult for the actors. I think he's a, a peachy, peachy guy, as we used to say. What he's asking for is an open government. That, that is our covenant with the people. That's what our founding fathers intended, that this be a government in which everybody participated, everybody knew what was going on, and everybody had their say as to whether it was right or wrong. The crowd that set up this government, uh, after a great deal of thought and bickering and struggling and fighting with each other, 
came to the decisions which are uh, laid down in our Constitution. And if certainly, if, if it speaks for anything, it speaks for a complete openness between those who are governed and those who govern, who finally are elected by those who are governed. They're, they're not there by any grace of God. It definitely has something of significance to say, or at least it tries to, hopes to. And uh, if it all gels and works, it uh, it could be a picture of some importance. It'll be exciting. It's bound to be exciting when they come to the scene where those silo doors begin to open and the missiles start to come out that it's really scary as hell. It's a big story, and I guess it also reflects sort of the... Uh, cynicism of the 70s, uh, sort of a disenchantment with what had happened with the Nixon administration that uh, perhaps the establishment as such is no longer really to be trusted. And that really is a, perhaps a, a way of that, um, at least I think the story is about, uh, about that uh, people really are, should and have, are capable of taking the responsibility for their government and should have a lot more to say about it. And that, uh, and they are capable of understanding and dealing with uh, so-called top secrets and uh, the sort of machinations behind the uh, that great wall of uh, Washington D.C. In, one, in some ways, it's very frightening. In some ways, it's also very encouraging that uh, that we are uh, at least in a country where these things can be talked about, still can be uh, dealt with, even on the screen, and perhaps something can be done about it. It's a very, in some ways, a very cynical film. I think it leaves uh, an audience with a lot of things to think about, a lot of things to sort of uh, to go home and mull about. It also has a lot of uh, action, adventure, a kind of uh, the usual sort of uh, uh, excitement in terms of um, is he going to make it, is he not going to make it, uh, is he going to get this out, is he going to be able to say this, or who's the good guy, who's the bad guy. Uh, there's a lot of levels which I think will make it, besides the political statement, will make it an interesting and perhaps also an entertaining film. And in terms of the, the script, uh, my character is not really um, patriotic. He has, uh, there's not really spelled out exactly why he's in prison, but uh, if you read the newspapers about why so many uh, more blacks are on death row than uh, white people are, there's any number of reasons why he would be bitter and why perhaps he uh, should not be there any more than uh, Bert, the character that Burt Lancaster is playing. Um, my particular character is also a sort of a goad and points out uh, this military man's innate racism, although it's, uh, it's very subtle in the film, but I mean it's there. Uh, there is also a sort of a power struggle between the two of us eventually, but uh, and we both realize that we need each other to survive, and that's really what it's all about. I think the things I've always enjoyed the most is his driving sense of humor and keeping a kind of a, uh, a likeness, no matter, of course, a lot of money is at stake. I mean, there's millions of dollars, not necessarily his own, but I mean, a lot of other people's money, and it's his responsibility to get this all done well and correctly and fast. But to do that, with all that sort of pressure, and still somehow uh, get people to laugh, and uh, to relax and put a joke in where, where people are starting to pull their hair out, is wonderful, truly wonderful. If we do our job, meaning uh, the writers, the actors, and the directors, not necessarily in that order, uh, we plan to pose a, a terribly thoughtful, provocative uh, dilemma for the audiences of uh, what passes for Western culture, Western civilization. Uh, we don't are not pretentious enough to presume that we have the answer. We only pose the question, can a, uh, a free society stay free and function without telling its citizens the truth? Terribly, terribly profound question. And if you asked anybody that question and uh, give me a yes or no answer, 
Uh, you know, there is no answer. Uh, if you tell it against a, a uh, background of action, adventure, excitement, uh, thrills, hostage, uh, potential death, uh, uh, then it doesn't become a pamphlet. Then you, uh, you hope, and that's the key operative word, you hope that uh, what the picture creates is arguments and uh, violent disagreements. I guess probably it is, uh, has a lot to do with the male menopause. You get to a certain uh, age, uh, with a certain security in what you're doing. And you say, I just don't want to make another um, picture that is only entertainment. Uh, the dilemma, of course, is if you make a picture that isn't entertainment, I don't care how valid the statement is, people aren't going to see it. There are many fine, fine films made that were uh, statement pictures. And they weren't entertaining and nobody went to see them. So it's very, very important that you, uh, that you make uh, entertaining pictures uh, that have a statement inherent in the fabric of the story. If they're not entertaining, uh, nobody's going to come to see it. Well, he's a Ellsberg kind of man in that he became radicalized by the war. He's a uh, West Point uh, graduate. He uh, is a man 65 years old. He uh, uh, has been busted out of the army because his opinions of what happened in Vietnam uh, aren't, uh, aren't acceptable by the military. Uh, and he's, an, he's a rebellious... Uh, man, a seeker of truth, who, who uh, also late in life says to hell with it. I'm not going to play the game anymore. Well, Bert uh, found within himself, and I don't know how, you know, if I knew that, I guess I'd be a psychiatrist, a way to grow gracefully as an actor. Uh, when he got to be 45, he was happy to play parts of men 45. He had to be 50, he was delighted to play parts of men 50. And you and I know without naming him or a dozen great big stars who wear hair pieces and still want to get the girl at age 70, and uh, it's nonsense. Uh, Bert uh, took a very objective, practical viewpoint of his career, and uh, at the 62, he doesn't want to win the 20-year-old uh, girl. He'll play a guy 62, and he doesn't uh, care if he looks 62 as long as he's uh, right for the part and he's good in the part, and he's an actor. Sure, he's a movie star, but he's not a movie star in, in, in terms of how good do I look and are my clothes fit, and uh, you know, which is all the nonsense you get involved in with these aging prima donnas.